My name is Jean Page. I'm the spokesperson person for Procure and a survivor for uh, uh, prostate uh, cancer. I had a diagnosis in 95. I was operated in 96, and four years after my operation, around the year 2000, I started talking about it because I thought that Canadian men were hiding in the cupboards, uh, in the closet, and didn't, uh, because they didn't really want to speak about it uh, with their wife, uh, their children, and their friends. So, uh, so I, uh, after, after a while, and through pro Cure, and with uh, the help of Dr. Uh, Fred, uh, Dr. Lacombe, and other oncologists, we went a long way. Uh, we now have uh, uh, two new drugs, uh, uh, who, uh, which uh, are now available and are very, very helpful for those who may have a, a recurrence or maybe hormonal resistant. Uh, it is the right word, isn't it? Uh, so uh, castrate resistant. So uh, welcome to this uh, Procure conference. We do to that twice a year, once in Montreal and one in Quebec City. Uh, the conference is called Nutrition, Exercise and uh, Prostate Cancer. Why, when and how? So we would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here in the room. And thank you also uh, to you following us uh, via uh, web. The conference uh, will be on our website in French and in uh, English. We thank all participants following us via the web since the conference is broadcast live in both French and English on our website, procure.ca. Thank you also to our speakers who have accepted to share their time and their knowledge with us uh, this evening, Dr. Louis Lacombe and Dr. Vincent Fradette. Uh, deepest thanks also to our sponsors, Estella and Janssen, who have made this evening possible. Uh, these are the two pharmaceutical companies which have uh, Medulaterum as a uh, drug, the new drug that I was referring to earlier. For those following us via internet, uh, if you have not heard the voice of our translator as yet, please click the button English version in the lower right corner of, of your screen. Please note uh, that your questions uh, will uh, be possible after the two uh, speakers have finished their uh, presentation. So please take good notice of your questions. You can also ask your questions, those of you on the web uh, via internet. You can submit your questions in French or in English using uh, the uh, button Ask a Question. It will be read uh, during the uh, evening. So with, before going on with our first uh, speaker, I would like to introduce uh, or present to you a short uh, uh, testimony that I made a few years ago that you can find on the website called The Words and the Gestures That Cure. It is a very pertinent testimony still today. It was made by Marquise uh, uh, Lepage, a producer in Montreal, who uh, really dedicated herself to the illness, made numerous documentaries, uh, the illness and sexuality. She uh, first uh, uh, made documentaries on breast cancer, after that on uh, prostate uh, cancer. So you can see that uh, les mots et les gestes qui soignent in French or the words and the gestures that cure or, uh, or, or just type Marquise Lepage it's, uh, and then you will have access to these documentaries because there are many women here in the room today. Uh, the documentary on breast cancer is very moving because the person who is really the thread, the person who was ill right after the film, uh, after the, uh, right after this film uh, died, and, uh, and on, in the other one, uh, on uh, prostate uh, cancer, there are also very moving testimonies because Marquise is using people from all uh, walks of life, and it's very interesting. So please listen to this, uh, this uh, short documentary that I did with her a few years back. I knew nothing about prostate. I didn't even know what it was for. I didn't even know it existed. Today, now we know, but we're talking uh, 13 years ago. In 95, I had received my uh, diagnosis in December. I got the news on the 22 of December, uh, operation a few weeks after that in January of 96. I knew nothing about it. 13, uh, 13 years ago, it was a taboo, really. Men didn't uh, talk about this. Uh, 
they were ashamed to have a prostate cancer. So it took me four years before really being able to, to speak about it with some distance. We're still always very emotive uh, with respect to cancer. It's very personal. Uh, and four years after, I finally managed to speak about it, but I felt still really quite emotive about it. I was a bit trapped uh, by uh, Quebec Canadian, uh, Quebec Cancer Society. I was asked to uh, be a speaker. There were 500 people in the room, numerous doctors. My doctor, my oncologist was there from Notre Dame in Montreal. And, uh, and then, uh, so they were all there in the room, and some uh, uh, there were some people who had been operated. They was they passed on a little uh, piece of paper to me and saying it happened to me too. And we we nobody knew about it. We were all hid because it's linked to sexual performance. And us man, performance is always so important. We want to be the best in everything we do, best car, best job, best salary. We want to be the best father, the best uh, husband the best the lover, the best in everything. So it's not after a reflection. It came a bit by accident. And then I realized it made sense what I was saying. It made sense to try and help men. And I was able to do that. So little bit by little bit, I, beca I became a spokesperson for the foundation. And I think that uh, for some five years now, we've done a lot of progress. I can say that we've really get, we, we, we're out of the closet now. We have still a lot to, to do before. Uh, reaching what women have done with the breast cancer. But we know there's a tunnel and we know there's a light at the end and we're getting there. And I think that we'll uh, be able to uh, make men more aware of this uh, problem and to speak about it. Because when we speak about it, a part, big part of the, prob of the problem is gone. It's true. At night, uh, you, you go to bed, you think about your cancer, you get up in the morning, you still think about it. With time, it may diminish a little bit, but it's always present in your mind. So when you can speak about it, when you can talk about it with uh, your people around you, you can speak about it in, in meetings, it's really comforting. Incontinence, uh, urinary uh, difficulties, we never speak about that. We spoke about the illness, but uh, without entering into the details. I, I really got into the uh, the details when I got involved uh, in uh, Procure Foundation Awareness uh, Days on uh, prostate cancer. So, uh, so, and then we got into the details, and we met people similar to me. Even I had problems uh, talking about it, but uh, talking about it really is really solving a part of the problem, and it's certainly comforting. Uh, we have to talk about it. Men have to be able to free themselves from these taboos, these fears, these fantasies of uh, male fantasies. And those who are ill, uh, you have to speak. The awareness days on uh, cancer prostate, I did that for three years. The first year, people were a bit uh, ill at ease. And the second year, well, they were asking more questions, uh, more precise questions about their sexual life after the operation, what will happen afterwards, how it will happen. And the third year, I did that uh, at the uh, Desjardins complex in Montreal. So questions were very clear. Only questions about that. Uh, I think it, it, there had been a big progression. Uh, that's five years ago. So for, uh, in five years, we really have gone a long way relation with the doctor. I always say you have to trust your physician. If you are operated, the trust between the patient and the physician is very important. What is he going to say if I, you say you don't want to be operated uh, by him? It's your life. It's your prostate. It, 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 it's your responsibility. If you don't like your, your physician, change physician. Urologists have a, a very human attitude with respect to this illness. I think a urologist uh, have understood that there was a psychological aspect of great importance in the treatment of a prostate cancer. It's very beneficial for the patient. But the problem, when we are in the office of our physician and he says that we have a cancer,
That's, it's the end of it. The only word we remember is cancer. Even if we would like to listen to what the doctor is saying, we, we don't understand. The only word that sticks to our mind is the word cancer. And then we go back home. I, I went through that three years, three days in the basement. People come to see you, and you try and, and go beat about the bush. And after uh, three days, you start having questions to ask. But the, the, the doctor cannot see you. His waiting room is full of people. So that was a shock. Yes, so Procure exists uh, for the past uh, 10 years, and we're really proud to have Jean as our spokesperson. He's been with us since the very beginning. I met Jean when and I had my diagnosis at 40 years, 48 years of age. I didn't know Procure, and uh, Jean is a very human uh, individual. Excuse me. He Procure was uh, founded in uh, 2003, founded by men uh, who realize, uh, like Jean, that there is no information for people with uh, uh, prostate cancer. And the founder, Mr. Marvin Kussler, decided to have a website and to give the information in French and in English for men who uh, have uh, prostate cancer. So Procure's mission is. Is, there to, is to help a scientist and help men with cancer and don't necessarily want to speak about it. So we uh, act on three fronts. First is research, awareness. Uh, this film sounds, uh, this helps us precisely about awareness and finally education and support. So it was, uh, uh, we uh, launched a biobank in uh, 2007. Uh, we decided not necessarily to invest in a research project, but in a biobank. So 2,000 uh, uh, 2000, uh, Quebecers gave their blood, their, their urine, their prostate, so that we could, we could have a bank. So 400 hours. Uh, uh, various centers, various hospitals, uh, hundreds of uh, patients uh, are working on this research. So this information is also combined with a socio-demographic uh, analysis. How do we live? Uh, uh, those who died in our family from cancer, all this information helps those who want to do research. In this respect, the procurer has uh, started giving, uh, uh, distributing uh, sam samples uh, here in Quebec City for uh, new cancer recurrence markers, and finally a project at the U.S. National Human Genome uh, Research Institute for the characterization and full genome analysis of prostate cancer. We keep these samples, and now they are being used by researchers. We're very proud of this uh, uh, project. Uh, Procure is a Quebec organization, and, uh, and uh, it, the, uh, it is funded by donors do, uh, and big companies and sponsors. In November, we have a, we, we have November campaign. And what we do in November, we sell a bow ties. You see that uh, all speakers will have a bow tie here. In November, from uh, October 15 to November the 30th, it is how we want to distinguish ourselves in November. November is uh, in a, a very good way to uh, work on this awareness campaign. Campaign, and all this money will be given to procure, and, 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 and we want to 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 do offer the services to uh, our uh, patients. So in November we have uh, ambassadors uh, from the sports team in Montreal. Pratsy, Brandon Cross from the uh, Canadian, and Bruyette, uh, who decided to support us, uh, support the cause of November. The 19th of November is uh, National Day, um, and it will be Quebec Day for Awareness on uh, Prostate Cancer. We ask Quebecers to uh, get the R bow tie and to wear it during that day. They can uh, wear it throughout the month of November, if they will. Those uh, who will wear it can uh, win a prize. Um, a corporate uh, 
uh, launch of, to see the Canadians or see the Alouettes or the impact in Montreal. So the winner will have these uh, tickets and have a chance to win uh, this prize. We have also other campaigns. We have a, a walk. Uh, on Father's Day uh, to, um, for families of uh, persons who suffered from this cancer. We also have a, a tour, a bicycle tour of courage. I, I was 48 and I was in full uh, swing and yet uh, we still can have cancer. Um, the, the, regarding education and support, well, we say there are seven good reasons to use Procure's support services. Our website, first. Um, um, uh, procure.ca, you'll see all uh, what you want to know. Uh, we also have a, a line, a telephone number with professionals, uh, five uh, nurses who will be in, able to answer uh, your questions. Jean also makes support uh, with our uh, patients. I do the same. We, or we, uh, I'm not a doctor. Jean is not a doctor either. We're not there to give diagnosis, but we're there to support these men in their treatments. We offer uh, conferences. You have one uh, this evening, always one in Montreal and one in Quebec City. It is also offered on the web, and it's also translated and available on our uh, YouTube chain. We have also support groups in uh, Rome, uh, Missisquoi. There's a, a new group now, and uh, we are creating a small cell in Cowansville for francophones. It is also to make sure that uh, uh, these groups can have these support uh, groups uh, with ambassadors that uh, help us um, setting up these groups. We have a blog also. If you want to visit our, our blog, uh, um, you can visit it. We also have a newsletter uh, with all the information that is issued during the year and new publications that you have uh, seen just here. Two, uh, we have three new uh, uh, publications, Prostate Cancer, Understand Disease, and uh, um, the three uh, brochures, Cancer, pro uh, all these brochures have been validated by our urologist. Speakers, our, our, our conferences are on our website. You can see also the conferences we had in the years uh, gone. What do we do? We try to make a difference. Since 2003, we have invested $4 million in research. We have responded to more than 5,000 calls or emails from men with prostate cancer and their relatives. And we have organized more than 300 general public conferences. We have a conference in Sherbrooke with Pierre Lavoie. We have a support uh, group there. Uh, and our urologist at the uh, Sherbrooke Hospital who offers uh, this um, conference. So if you have questions, please feel free. And you can always contact uh, us on our uh, toll-free line. The number is here on the screen. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Laurent. You see, we are working a lot. We're a small foundation, uh, four employees at our office. Everyone is a volunteer, uh, like me. Uh, only Laurent and our three employees who receive a salary. Uh, and uh, don't, it's not really competitive with uh, the industry, especially in your case. So with no further ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the first uh, speaker, Dr. Louis Lacan. He uh, received a diploma from uh, Sherbrooke University in uh, 88. He uh, finished in 96 a specialization in uh, oncological urology at the Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center in New York. Since 96, he's oncologist, urologist at the uh, Schick Hospital and also a researcher at the Research Center on uh, Cancer at Laval University, where he has carried out more than 60 studies. Dr. Lacombe has published more than 40 articles and 135 uh, scientific summaries dealing with oncological urology, and he's been a guest speaker in about 12 events throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, greet uh, Dr. Louis Lacan. So thank you, Mr. Paget, for your, your moving testimony. Uh, in uh, the next uh, presentation, we'll be talking about uh, prostate cancer where are we in 2014? Uh, clearly, uh, cancer, pros, uh, pro, uh, prostate cancer is very broad. We won't be dealing about all aspects, but I will try and answer certain questions uh, during my presentation. 
So we'll be speaking about uh, screening. We'll talk about hormonal therapy, intermittent therapy versus continuous therapy. We'll be talking about uh, chemo chemotherapy. During this uh, presentation, uh, we'll uh, uh, be speaking about new treatment. Uh, to strengthen the bones. Uh, we'll be talking about new molecules that uh, appeared in uh, the past uh, four years, abiraterone, enzylatomid, and radium-223. And we'll see that these molecules can be introduced uh, now at, uh, at more uh, at earlier stages. And we'll talk about a possible new uh, treatment. So you have here the bladder. And the prostate is just on under the bladder. And to this, we have uh, vesicles, uh, seminal vesicles, uh, which are uh, uh, reservoirs. The prostate, uh, here we have the prostatic urethra, and, uh, and after that, you have the penis. And this, uh, this is the pubian bone, so it is the basin again. And behind uh, the prostate, you have the rectum. So when we look at the uh, statistics of the past years, we see that uh, in Canada and in Quebec, uh, there were 23,600 uh, new cases diagnosed in uh, 2013 and 3,900 deaths if in Quebec. It is uh, 4,600 men diagnosed in Quebec and 880 that same year died. If we make a parallel in 20 there were 18,200 diagnoses, uh, so, so it is increasing. However, um, with the screening, with the introduction of new treatments, we see that the uh, number of deaths have decreased a little bit. So what does this correspond to? It means that in Canada, every day, it's about 70 di new diagnoses a day and it's about 11 deaths a day. Globally, when we look at a broad population, if I have seven men in front of me, we know that the statistics says about one man, one man out of seven will receive a diagnosis of prostate cancer in his life, and one out of 28 who unfortunately will die from it. Now, if let's speak about the screening of uh, prostate cancer. A few years back, when some studies, screening studies, and American study appeared, um, uh, American media, among others, were were quite uh, harsh with respect against uh, screening, uh, saying, should we continue doing uh, screening? Is it worth it? Is it a good way uh, for men? Uh, uh, and if you look at the recommendations of the Canadian Task Force issued a, a few uh, days back, we're still wondering if it's really uh, a good idea. So what do we know? Well, in Quebec, uh, the uh, College of Doctors of Physicians have established some standards. And what does the uh, College of Physicians have said? Well, four elements in this uh, in this uh, note. First, uh, physicians can consider uh, screening uh, for men between seven, 55 and 70 years of age with a life expectancy of more than 10 years, or for younger patients for whom uh, the risk is high because of family uh, reasons or uh, people of uh, uh, black race. Second recommendation, given the uh, uncertainties, we should inform the patient of the advantages and uh, disadvantages of uh, screening. We should not do screening of men when they are more than 70 years of age or if their life expectancy is of less than 10 years. And last recommendation is that if we're to do a screening, we should use APS or PSA test and the rectal touch. What is PSA? Well, PSA is a blood test. It is a blood test. We make a sample. and the the test recognizes a protein uh, created by the prostate, and that can be uh, easily measured. It is not painful, and the result uh, will uh, give us uh, some information. If we want to do screening, we should uh, do this 
PSA test, we should do that with a rectal touch. What is a rectal touch? Well, we will feel the prostate of these persons. What are we looking for when we touch the prostate? It's like if I were uh, touching the inside of my hand. It's firm, but also smooth uh, at the same time. When we look for the little nodule here, what am I looking for? It's like if I, I, I am, I, I am, I'm, I'm looking for an induration, a structure that will be more firm inside the prostate. This structure, if uh, if you have a doubtful uh, rectal touch, it is this uh, that we'll want to have a biopsy of in order to do a diagnosis. When we look at the studies that were carried out with respect to screening, two broad studies were carried out. First, an American study where more than 70,000 men participated. The problem with this study is that the screening uh, test had a problem of contamination, more than 40% of the patients, of the participants to this test or this study had already had a screening uh, or, or more than a screening before uh, the study. So of course, uh, this contamination uh, uh, blurred the results. This study was negative. The other broad study that was carried out is a European study, and the European study included a, a great amount of participants, more than 180,000. 80,000 were assigned to the screening group. The others, about 100,000, were assigned to the control group. In the uh, screened group, more than 6,800 had prostate cancer diagnosis and 4,800 in the other group. And and what did this study show with the follow-up? Well, after 11 years, we demonstrated that we could diminish the risk of dying from cancer, prostate cancer, by 29% in the screened group with respect to the control group. And these results were significant. But there was no difference on general mortality of the population. But this study was not meant to detect a difference in the survival rate in uh, the global population. It was really survival for a prostate cancer patient. So these results indicated a diminution of about 29% of the diminution of 29% uh, of the risk uh, of death. Uh, for uh, prostate cancer, no incidence on global mortality. The screening must be done by on about 1,000 men for such a study, uh, to, for such a study to show some advantages. And to save one life by screening, we must uh, treat 37 persons. This is the result of uh, the European study. There is another study that was carried out in Göteborg in Sweden. And in this study, they included about 20,000 men. The screening was done every two years. Uh, this uh, study was better uh, carried out because the follow-up was more rigorous. And what did we show here? Uh, reduction of about 44% of mortality by caused by uh, prostate uh, cancer by in the group that was screened with respect to the controlled group. The study was really better made compared to the American study anyway. So prost uh, cancer, prostate cancer kills, but many patients with a diagnosis do not need to be treated, and uh, some are under-treated. So uh, our attention shouldn't uh, dwell on uh, screening, but rather who should be screened, who should be treated, uh, how uh, should they be treated. So screening is useful, but we shouldn't treat all the men uh, that are affected. And maybe some of you here uh, or at home have uh, had a diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer. And when you met your physician, maybe we talked with you of the possibility of having a steady follow-up. Where does this uh, habit come from? Well, from some publication, including that of Dr. Albertson. For example, you are a man of between 60 and 64 years of age. You have a diagnosis of prostate uh, cancer. You are in the little zone here. Each box means five years. So the 60 to 64 year old man 
uh, with uh, this study shows uh, that if we have a strict follow-up in the 15 years uh, that show up here, the probability that you will would die and that they will, there would be progression in death because of uh, prostate cancer in these 15 years, the probability of death is about of 22 percent after 15 uh, years for a man with glycine 6. The probability of um, this man would die from another cause, be it a car accident, a heart attack, is higher than the risk to die to die from uh, prostate cancer. But if it's glisten 7, um, if you have a, a little more aggressive pattern on your biopsy, this this risk of dying after 15 years has increased to 60%. If it's a, a glycine 8, it's about 80% uh, of uh, death in the uh, 15 years uh, after that. So we see that the illness uh, according to the glycine is not the same for everyone. This is why it is important to have a good, di a good discussion with the person with a diagnosis. So what else can we do? We can propose strategies to improve the detection of high risk uh, cancers. And for that, we have molecular tests. One of them is called PCA3. It is not a test that we can use in everyday clinics because it is not reimbursed. But when we, um, when we do this test, what do we measure? Well, it is a test of uh, ARN amplification, and we we uh, we want to detect uh, the P S A R A N, uh, and this will uh, show a probability according to the ratio that you will have, that they be a cancer in the prostate. For example, if your ratio is weak, like here, 5 to 9, the probability of having a, a biopsy uh, diagnosed cancer will be of such. But, if, but here, the probability uh, will be much higher, around 70%. So the PCA3, what it will it give us is a better selection of our patients in order perhaps to have a prostate biopsy. Not only this uh, test can show these results, but also according to the results of the PCA3, uh, according to the rate that you will have, and if uh, these studies are, are, are made uh, on men uh, uh, who have uh, undergone a prostatectomy, the, 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 the more the volume of cancer was high, uh, and, uh, and more, the higher the PCA3 score, the higher the probability of, uh, of having a uh, uh, glisten uh, cancer of high uh, magnitude. Maybe we could use this test to better uh, selection uh, those who should have a biopsy. Second aspect, uh, I would like to talk to you. Maybe it is not necessary to give hormonal treatments on a continuous basis. What we have to understand is that before, when a man presented an advance uh, or metastatic uh, illness, we would uh, give the treatments on a continuous basis. The day hormonal therapy started, we didn't stop it. And in the past years, some studies have shown that that if you, uh, we compare intermittent and continuous treatment, and and this applies here to a man with a hormonal sensitive illness, and this study shows it's called PR7 study. It was carried out by Dr. Crook, a Canadian doctor, and uh, in this study we had a group of patients in a random uh, uh, manner was given a continuous treatment, and the other group. Um, received um, a, a suppression of androgens during uh, eight months. We uh, started, again, uh, the hormonal uh, treatment when the PSA was higher than 10. So eight months of hormonal therapy, we would stop it. And when a PSA became higher than 10 again, we would restart this treatment. And this study was uh, stopped early because we had reached the uh, criteria of satisfaction of the study. And what has the study shown? Well, globally, there was no difference in the survival rates.
How can we represent that? Well, as I have said, uh, if we treated, uh, we would start hormonal therapy, PSA would do go down here, and when uh, we stopped it for a little while, hormonal therapy, uh, then the testosterone, which is the hormone blocked by hormonal therapy, increased again. When patients had a certain value of PSA, we would start again hormonal therapy, PSA would go down again, and etc. So globally, this study, if you want to study it, it is the PR7. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. This study showed that there was no difference in the survival rate of any significance between the continuous group uh, with respect to the group that was treated in an intermittent um, basis. Also, it has shown that some participant um, could undergo up to seven cycles of hormonal therapy. So we had a first cycle. When it was a failure, we had a second one, etc. We see that the participants with these uh, uh, cycles uh, were going downwards, but, but still quite a few had many cycles of hormonal therapy. The other aspect that I want to talk uh, about here is that uh, uh, chemotherapy can uh, uh, extend life in cases uh, of advanced uh, prostate cancer. Chemo, chemotherapy, for a long time we thought uh, before uh, the uh, chemo that only hormonal therapy was the possible treatment for prostate cancer uh, in an advanced stage. And in 2004, we had the uh, we had a chemotherapy with uh, docetaxel uh, given every three weeks. And that has uh, allowed, uh, that has permitted us to extend uh, life for uh, many months and diminish the pain. It is well tolerated. Uh, we are sometimes uh, afraid that with chemo we'll be ill and have a bad tolerance to the treatment. But this uh, treatment was quite well tolerated, even by uh, older persons. And in general, we were able to give between six to ten. Uh, treatments. Uh, these are these uh, uh, graphs of the global survival rates that was presented in the New uh, England Journal of Medicine in 2004 by Professor Tanak. We could see that the group uh, who had received uh, uh, docetaxel had, uh, had a higher level of survival than those who had received metoxantron in the 90s. It was a, a standard treatment and didn't really improve uh, the survival rate. Not only we had an improvement of uh, the survival rate globally, but uh, when we give docetaxel, we see that uh, a certain proportion of men will uh, live much more than three years, uh, ne uh, nearly 20, uh, 18 percent more exactly. So chemo not only can ease and soothe, but improve also the survival rate with uh, patients with uh, castrate-resistant ca uh, prostate cancers, and it can repeat, be repeated a few times. Uh, for example, a man here, we start uh, chemo, and uh, there's a, a series of uh, s between six to 10 infusions. Chemo was stopped after a few days, uh, PSA increased again. We started a new cycle of chemo, and again we stop second cycle. So sometimes, for those who tolerate that quite well, we can uh, have uh, a few cycles of chemo like this. So we see that uh, when we look at the, the various phases of the treatment for uh, uh, prostate uh, cancer treatment, when I came back from New York in uh, 1994, the only treatment we had was the metoxantron. Uh, and then uh, progressively we had docetaxel, the uh, zoledronic acid we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, also. But it's especially in the past uh, four years that we have new do drugs and we'll be speaking about in a little while. One of them is the cabacitaxel. It's chemotherapy of third generation. And this chemo was given to men who had already had a treatment with uh, docetaxel. Uh, they had uh, had the docetaxel treatment and did not respond to uh, chemo. Uh, they were randomized to receive cabacitaxel or mitrosantron. And what we demonstrated is that cabacitaxel improved uh, the survival rate of these patients uh, of a few months with, with respect to mitrosantron. Cabacitaxel right now is not a drug that is reimbursed in Quebec, but we know that it is a drug that uh, uh, Xenophy uh, tries to get uh, authorization 
application for reimbursement. So uh, men with uh, uh, prostate cancer who did not uh, respond to the Cetaxel, we could uh, uh, give this uh, chemo. Uh, there are also treatments that have appeared with a name to reinforce uh, the bones, to reduce the complications in the bone structures caused by metastasis. We, see, we know two things. First, when we give a hormonal therapy, there is a risk of osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? Well, it is, it, it is an illness of the bones for men or women characterized by a weak bone mass. And if it's, it becomes really weak, well, we can, uh, it can cause uh, uh, ruptures. It's, it becomes very fragile and it can break. And testosterone, when we remove it from man, it can really cause a fragility in the bone uh, mass in men. It was cre clearly proved. If we look at a group of men here with, uh, the, who did not receive any hormonal uh, treatment uh, in purple, and in red here, you have men with a tr hormonal treatment. The proportion of men who have uh, survived with no uh, uh, bone breakage, well, uh, it is quite clear. So there is a risk of complication. Not only there is hormonal therapy, but the cancer uh, itself is at stake. We know that w with when a man has uh, uh, prostate cancer, bones are at risk. We see the femur here. We see there is a lesion in the bone. There is a fracture, uh, pathological. What can happen? What other complication? We can have medullary com uh, compression. We see that the proliferation of uh, cancer cells here in the bone marrow, uh, there is a compression, and uh, it, it can cause uh, uh, the, the, the patient can be paralyzed. There is necessity of radiotherapy or surgery to correct uh, the problem. We know that if we follow these patients long enough, for example, during two uh, years, well, a third of these men will probably need uh, uh, radiotherapy because of uh, bone pains caused by the uh, uh, cancer. About, uh, uh, a th fourth will have pathological uh, broken uh, limbs, and, uh, and uh, fortunately, we have a new uh, drugs, uh, Dinozumal, and, uh, and these uh, drugs have diminished the probability of these uh, events to occur. Uh, these, that's the data with uh, Zometa, paper published in uh, 2002, uh, the Zometa drug, because uh, this drug um, diminished by about 22 percent the probability of uh, uh, the complications that I just mentioned uh, occur. Not only do we diminish that by 20 to 25 percent, but we increase the interval of, of the occurrence of these events by about five months. So globally, we diminish uh, the events, we increase uh, the interval and uh, the quality of life of these men with a bone metastasis will improve. In the last years, there was a study carried out uh, where we compared uh, men with uh, prostate cancer that was uh, refractory to hormones and with the bone metastasis. The, the, we gave the Zometa, and, uh, and, and the drug uh, that we gave in the other group, or, uh, in the random group, was the uh, denosumab. And in this study, what did we see? Well, the group with denosumab had an interval uh, which was increased by 18 percent compared to the Zometa patient regarding the bone problems, and globally, we saw that there was 18 a group, uh, uh, there were nearly 20 percent less uh, bone problems, uh, necessity of radiotherapy or, or chemo or surgery or uh, broken limb or medullar compression. This is why now when we have a man with uh, prostate cancer uh, castrate resistant frequently the drug that we'll give is a zgiva zgiva 
or denosumab, which is uh, the uh, medication that was considered superior, and this is what the government of Quebec reimbursed, reimburses now for these men if they have the right indication for that. Also, we know that these uh, drugs can help uh, prevent uh, bone losses, but uh, what can uh, the man with uh, prostate cancer do to help themselves? We recommend that they take calcium with uh, vitamin D, one or two uh, a day, and that will help uh, keeping uh, uh, bone masses in good health. We'll ask them to adopt good uh, life habits to stop smoking, diminish uh, the consumption of alcohol, to exercise, and to possibly to receive a, a treatment to a, a problem, to avoid the problems with uh, the bone mass. In the past uh, four years, as mentioned, there are new uh, treatments now available. Abiraterone and, and zalutamid, two uh, molecules that uh, Mr. Paget referred to earlier, and radium-223 is also a new drug that is just uh, coming. And these new drugs can extend uh, life um, even after an initial uh, chemo. So what happens? The patient has a prostate uh, cancer, perhaps uh, metastatic or not. We started the hormonal therapy. When we start a hormonal therapy, what do we do? We might remove your testicles or we give injections that will uh, withdraw the testosterone from the body of uh, the patient. Uh, what will happen? Well, the body will use other sources of uh, testosterone, perhaps in the surrenal gland. But also, the, sometimes the cancer can self-administer itself or self-produce testosterone, a cancer that can really adapt. How can that be demonstrated? What I was referring to earlier, before, we thought that by removing the testosterone in, present in uh, the blood, could not act in the, the, the cell. And when the, 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 the cancer modifies itself, it self-produces this testosterone to self-stimulate itself. And that's why it's called a castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So the abiraterone, well, in, uh, in our hormonal uh, cascade, uh, there will be no test here, <laughs> so you would know exactly where it acts. But what you should know is that the abiraterone blocks uh, uh, cycle 17, and we want to block the, process, the production of testosterone. And this blocking is made in the very cancer cell. So what have we done? We have uh, carried out a study. This study was carried out uh, with men with uh, uh, castrate-resistant uh, prostate cancer, but after chemo of uh, taxotel type. The chemo I talked about, the first one, it was the study Cougar 301, and we randomized the patients. Two out of three would receive the uh, abiraterone, and the other group would receive the placebo. And we looked at... Uh, uh, with time, we looked at the results. It was uh, stopped early. Why? Because in the group receiving abiraterone, the improve the improvement of the survival rate was really uh, significant than in the, the placebo group. So it was an improvement of 36 percent. When we stopped the study, the survival of this uh, patients with respect to the placebo group was clear. And uh, when we made the final analysis, when the various centers uh, who had uh, proposed the patients uh, in the study. We made the study and we saw that globally the survival rate was improved by a few months in the abiraterone group with respect to the placebo group. So after these uh, uh, studies, the government of Quebec had decided at some point that the abiraterone be uh, given to the patients after a chemo therapy because of this study here. There are secondary effects, though, uh, also present with any other drugs, because uh, 
uh, uh, because of cortisone, uh, and it is uh, linked to the abiraterone, uh, there are some uh, effects. For example, we have to follow up on their hypertension, perhaps uh, retention, and sometimes the uh, potassium rate in their blood might uh, diminish. The second molecule is the unsalutamid. Unsalutamid is a super anti-androgen. What does it do? Well, testosterone usually creates an action that will go towards uh, the nucleus. And uh, ensalutamid blocks uh, the receptor of testosterone here at the membrane level. And also it blocks the translocation that is uh, the passage from there uh, of uh, the cytoplasma towards uh, the nucleus, and it blocks the link in the nucleus of testosterone to uh, the receptor of the androgens. It blocks that everywhere to avoid that testosterone do its job. So in a group of patients with uh, uh, castrate-resistant uh, prostate cancer which had, uh, who received the chemo, we made a study uh, where we gave two to one, two uh, patients out of uh, three received N-salutamin, the other group uh, received a placebo. And what does that show? Well, the, survivor, uh, the, the survival rate improved in the uh, N-salutamin group it was about he, up to here, the, uh, the, the curve, about 18 months survival rate versus 13 months uh, here, uh, the curve for the placebo group. So for, there again, for uh, uh, castrate-resistant uh, cancer, uh, enzalutamid can be given. In patients with uh, prostate cancer at an advanced uh, stage, well, they can live longer now because what we're doing is that these molecules are introduced earlier. So here is it is the abiraterone. It is the Cougar uh, 302 that I presented uh, earlier. Patients who participated in this study had a uh, castrate-resistant uh, uh, prostate cancer with metastasis, but we had received no other form of treatment. We gave abiraterone to uh, certain groups and placebo to the other group. What did we demonstrate? That when we look at the uh, progression of, uh, of our patients, uh, we could improve this survival rate in about 60% of cases in the abiraterone with respect to placebo. If we look at the survival rate uh, in this group of patients, it is less advanced uh, stage than earlier. We could improve survival by about 25% in the abiraterone group with respect to the placebo. Of course, if the study is, was made with abiraterone, it was also uh, done with the ensalutamid, with the same type of patient, with a metastasis, with, with no other form of, pay, of treatment except hormonal therapy, so castrate resistant again. And what did we do? So a group of patients. What I wanted to show is that a group of patients received ensalutamid and the other one, the other group placebo. These uh, curves, what we could see is that uh, the survival with no uh, radiation progression, a greater proportion of patients had not received any progression in the study compared to the placebo group. We could improve uh, the survival uh, with no progression by 80 percent. That's quite quite significant. We could diminish the risk of death uh, by uh, the cancer by about 30 percent, and, and we could slow the moment uh, where we would have to start using chemo by about 17 months. So very interesting figures. Also, we have uh, the uh, radium-223 that is used in nuclear medicine. Maybe you've heard uh, that uh, uh, before we could uh, use uh, to, we could beta particles for men with many metastases. With the problem with the beta emitter, there is a, a radiation field around the, uh, around the particle, and the marrow could be uh, 
affected and with a lot of secondary effects with the new molecule produced by Bayer called radium-223. These uh, molecules are more targeted. It's an alpha particle, and uh, the, the radiation is closer to the cell, and the marrow is uh, uh, less affected, and it's le better uh, tolerated. And when we tested these uh, drugs, always with the same patients, with a, with a castrate-resistant patient, uh, we could see that we can diminish the skeletal event. Uh, we can diminish the necessity for chemo, etc. We can improve all that by 33 percent, uh, and we improve survival by 30 percent with these uh, patients when we compare them with uh, uh, placebo. So we see that we have numerous new molecules that uh, uh, are there on the market for which we have indications that are uh, quite interesting. So. Um, I, 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 for me, it's like an iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg, what, uh, what I've been uh, speaking about. It is the gastrate-resistant cancer. What will happen in the coming months or years with research? Well, these molecules will be introduced more and more earlier and earlier, that is, with uh, patients with uh, 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 hormonotherapy-sensitive illnesses. Uh, neoadjuvant or adjuvant uh, risk. Uh, so we will use these treatments to prevent uh, new occurrences or even as a curative uh, treatment. So in the years to come, we're pretty sure that uh, the development of new molecules will be for these indications here. And a good example of the iceberg model is a chartered study. It was presented this year at the LASCO. Who was included in this study? It's a group of patients with uh, metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Sometimes in our clinics, we have patients, they have a lot of metastasis, and uh, the standard treatment who have never been treated, it is hormonal therapy. In this uh, study, what did we do? We randomized a patient in two groups, one group of patients received one, a horm standard hormonal therapy, the basic uh, treatment that we do usually. The other group received hormonal therapy with six cycles uh, of uh, chemo. What did we see? Well, uh, surprisingly, we improved the survival rate of the patients with hormonal therapy and chemo by um, nearly 40 percent. So average survival was uh, 57 months compared to 44 months in the uh, hormone only hormonal therapy group. So we're changing again the way we are going to treat uh, metastatic cancer treatment. Uh, before, we had only hormonal therapy, and this study shows that hormonal therapy with uh, 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 chemo, we have these better results. Also, promising new treatments will uh, perhaps be offered, and all this, well, uh, it's not necessarily uh, thanks to Procure only, but Procure certainly is a, a group that can help uh, uh, through its uh, website, as Mr. Poole has mentioned earlier. So what's the point with this research? We want to identify with for a patient with uh, prostate cancer, the treatment that is really necessary for him, um, because each cancer is different and everybody should have an appropriate uh, treatment, a personalized, customized uh, medicine. How can we do this? Well, probably using uh, molecular prints. We'll make a genotype of uh, your genes. We'll look at your cancer, and we will establish what's your profile. And with this profile, maybe we'll be able, in the years to come, to be able to have a really targeted therapy. For example, in uh, your case, we might identify an, a, a sick gene. We, we know that this gene uh, produces an RNA, and uh, it produces a protein. So. Uh, we will uh, see that this gene was not good for you. We will uh, shoot a, an uh, oligonucleotides and we will infuse it. It will um, uh, it will be linked to the mRNA, and this protein will not be able to be produced, and this protein will be non-functional. 
it's not for today, but uh, be sure that this type of molecules are doing clinical uh, studies right now, and in the future, it is something that probably will be used. So we'll be able to combine that with hormonal therapy, with chemo. So the future is a customized uh, medicine for each uh, patient with cancer be able to receive his, his own <clears throat> cure. We talked about the biobank earlier. It is a collection of samples that we have put into place. We participated in this uh, biobank. We have um, 500 of our patients <clears throat> which accepted to participate. And if some of you here were part of this, well, thank you so much. It is thanks to you if we can have this customized medicine. These are the other centers who have also participated. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lacombe. What we have to uh, recall, it is quite complex, but what we have to recall is that there is a tremendous message of hope in what you have just shown to us. Um, in my case, it was in 95 uh, that I was diagnosed. And I was operated in 96, and we were quite far from everything you're showing now. And in the, in the 18 years that have gone by, we progressed a, a great deal. And that is thanks to research and, um, and biobank and all this research. And uh, prostate cancer is very important. I hope that our uh, Dr. Lacombe has been able to convince you that there's hope. Uh, it's not always easy to go through all this hormonal therapy all this medication, but it uh, extends life. And I think there is really a light at the end of uh, the tunnel. So we will take a 10 minute uh, break uh, to uh, digest all this and uh, because it is quite complex, but it will uh, allow us to really reflect on all this. And I think we can have really a profound uh, um, reflection uh, as regards uh, the new medication that uh, might be the best for you. We have coffee and fruits uh, if you uh, want to have a short break. And after that, we'll have a conference on nutrition precisely by Dr. Fredette. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with uh, Dr. Vincent Fradet, uh, who may, he was a resident in uh, urology before starting a PhD in uh, biomedical sciences in uh, clinical research, and he finished that in 2011 with an honorable mention. He also completed in 2009 a special uh, special in uh, on, on, oncology urology at University of California at San Francisco. Francisco. Dr. Fredette is one of only two Canadians who has these two expertise. Since September of 2009, Dr. Fredette is an assistant professor at Laval University, where he has a prolific career as researcher and clinician, and he is often invited to be a guest speaker. He has published 27 articles and has received more than $2 million in research funds, Dr. Fredette. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being so numerous here this evening. It is easier to speak to people uh, in, uh, uh, who are present, uh, but still I would like to uh, s greet all those who are at home watching, uh, watching this uh, through the web. I've been asked to speak about uh, nutrition. I'm a clinician, such as Dr. Lacombe and others, but also I'm a researcher um, interested by this uh, sector. And one of the reasons why I've been asked to speak about it, it is because this really involves everyone. We wonder if nutrition could prevent cancer. And I can say yes already and no, meaning perhaps yes and no. I, can, I could give you thousands of figures, but I have tried to uh, select uh, some data that would be more pertinent to what, uh, what uh, would be of interest to you and what we receive as questions from our patients. So there will be some figures, but not that many. Um, if there are too many, do let me know. Uh, if you want more, well, do let me know also. Uh, those of you at home, you can do the same. So 
We'll try and respect uh, the time. Uh, I have about 30 minutes, so I'll try and respect uh, that deadline. Uh, prostate uh, cancer, Dr. Lacombe has talked about it uh, in detail, but it is uh, the most uh, frequent uh, cancer. And uh, from one year to another, for men, it is the second or third uh, reason of, uh, for mortality. It is the fourth cause of uh, death in, uh, in all the cancers, uh, for all the sex. It is as frequent as, uh, as the breast cancer. Uh, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as frequent as, uh, thank you for those of you who <laughs> noticed my mistake, I said cancer, uh, prostate cancer for women, but of course I meant breast cancer. Hormonal dependent cancers in both cases, uh, cancers with effect on the quality of life and sexual functions, and these cancers are quite dependent on the environment. Uh, the causes of uh, these cancers, if we could understand them better, we could prevent them better. Also, they are complex illnesses because there are numerous causes and because there are numerous uh, factors on which we could intervene to prevent uh, cancer. That's true for all uh, stages of uh, the illness before the, the diagnosis, but also after uh, the uh, diagnosis and in case of uh, reoccurrence as well, or prevention is a very broad uh, term. And um, so it is one of the most important causes, one of the most frequented uh, cancers for men. And uh, there's a long uh, latent period. Prostate cancer, thank God, evolves rather slowly, usually. And uh, this means that there is a latent, latent phase uh, between when it starts uh, emerging and when it's clinically uh, detectable. Uh, uh, that's why we do screening. Um, so this uh, latent phase is uh, the very moment where we can do prevention. And uh, some of the elements that I'll be showing uh, this evening with respect to nutrition exercise also could be of some use. It can certainly apply. These are key elements, very important to understand in order to know why we want to do prevention and why nutrition could act. Just to give you an idea, uh, we have a colleagues uh, that died from pancreas cancer. It often evolves very rapidly. This colleague uh, died in, in weeks. Uh, the laps between when he was diagnosed and his death uh, uh, it was so short that nutrition in this case had very little impact. So it's important to understand the evolution of all these, uh, these cancers. Many things we can do to prevent cancer. And the reason why we need to do research to document that is that often we have counterparts. And I'll try to illustrate that with a few examples. I hope uh, you might find some uh, amusing. If um, we look at this um, screen here, geographically speaking, of the US here, we, uh, we can see a relation, an inverted uh, ecological uh, relation. We make profiles, we make associations per region and between groups of persons. So there is an inverted uh, uh, relation between the sun exposure, which of course is, is stronger going south, and the prostate incident, which is stronger going north. So maybe maybe we could prevent a prostate cancer giving more sun, but the problem is the sun can cause other forms of cancers. So it doesn't work. So globally, what we can say with respect to nutrition, and as you can see, my slides are in English. It is because we, it is a bilingual uh, uh, province, and it's, it's easier for me to use uh, slides in English. That's another reason. So uh, we will uh, alternate between uh, French and English. In, uh, uh, even my words sometimes are tainted by English because uh, we, uh, our literature is very much in English. But with respect to nutrition, uh, it's important to have a, to maintain a healthy uh, weight and to lose weight if uh, we are overweight. 
and it's true for all cancers. It's true for any illness, really. And uh, it's a general trend that we can draw, and uh, we won't spend more time on that. The other general trend is to eat more vegetables. Uh, you can see where I'm uh, talking about, right? I'm just giving you the main lines of uh, Canada Health. Uh, how can we eat the Canadian uh, uh, food guide uh, says the same. So that's what the best thing we can say. Eat, eat healthy food. You can do uh, a few th extraordinary things from time to time because it's fun, but it's good to have a healthy diet. Uh, it is better uh, uh, studied in terms of cardiovascular uh, diseases, but it's more and more studied also for cancers. And if you, if you want to if you really want to reduce the risk of cancer, there's no really any diet that will do that. But there's more and more evidence that suggests that a good uh, uh, nutrition will help. In the 90s, um, and uh, I won't give you too many details, but uh, uh, you have references in each of my slides. If you want to uh, go more into uh, these uh, details, you can look at all these sources. It's uh, going to be on the web. So if we look at uh, migrants, uh, Asians uh, to the left, Japanese, who immigrated from the US, and uh, here is the basic uh, ratio here, and who stayed in Japan, if we compare the, who, those who uh, immigrated late in their lives, uh, if we compare those who immigrated early in their lives, and if we compare those who were born, for example, Japanese born in the US, well, we see that the risk uh, increases in a significant manner by four times. While uh, in other communities, uh, this risk is not so clearly distinguishable. If we make a, a, a parallel with a, uh, Latino and Hispanos, it's not as clear. And uh, these associa associa association studies, uh, if we look at these risks, uh, well, we have data now that will help us uh, go more into depth. But I won't, I won't give you all these details. It's a bit too complex. But uh, the message is quite clear. So we wanted to know uh, the role of the environment because uh, cancer or any other disease have uh, genetic causes uh, coming from our genes, but also can be environmental. So it's important to to study uh, environmental issues because we can act on that. Uh, my genes, it's quite difficult to act on that, but the environment is something I can be uh, working on. And more and more in our populations, we can have an impact on pollution and and, and other factors uh, that are part of our physical environment. The diet between the Americas and Asia, quite clear, very different, less uh, animal uh, food in green, and more cereals and less fat, and different types of fat. And uh, here uh, we have a popular literature you can uh, see in so many magazines now how can you eat better uh, with the funny illustrations like here and uh, how uh, what are the what should we eat and uh, you have more and more of that published by a scientist uh, dr Bellivo. you might all know him he's very popular he has a tv show it's very interesting. It's well done. It's interesting. And other books uh, coming out uh, frequently, often published by, uh, by researchers. It's very interesting. But about everything you'll find here is based on cell-based uh, models, or not necessarily on humans, mainly on animals. It's difficult to do such studies on humans. And uh, there are contradictions sometimes to be found. So it's very interesting that we find here. It's promising. It's probably not uh, dangerous for your health. But still, it, it, it's not as, uh, as serious as if it were made on uh, humans. And we have a 2004 study about 10 years ago that demonstrated the prevalence of patterns of self-initiation of uh, uh, s uh, nutritional supplements for people at risk of ca uh, prostate cancer. It was a high proportion of men, more than 50% of men in this uh, 
center who had had it. And uh, it was said that Caucasians were uh, more likely to use, uh, to have these uh, uh, behaviors, and older men more than uh, young. Uh, the young population is prevalent to self uh, prescribe nutritional therapies. Let's look at some of them. I picked them uh, uh, with, uh, I picked a few with more evidence, but uh, but uh, rarely uh, evidence on humans. So there again, we have to be careful. I don't, to me, to, if, if, will it really affect me if I make these changes? Uh, capsaicin, uh, strong uh, peppers, uh, hot peppers. We uh, give uh, uh, various virtue, virtues, anti pro proliferative and apoptotic, uh, can uh, promote uh, destruction of cells, important for your cancers. Uh, certain uh, tumors are more specifically targeted than others, and it can also have an effect on the androgen androgenic uh, uh, effect. Uh, testosterone is very important uh, uh, substance, and it could uh, have an impact on it. Uh, the, some studies uh, in the preliminary studies in, in humans have shown that uh, uh, also or coming from the ginger um, that could be interesting for the cancer uh, curcuma um, um, Will I start using uh, ginger and curcumin to start uh, uh, to, to cure my cancer? Uh, maybe, um, uh, we, but we should uh, there again be careful. I, I won't give you all the, the mechanism, the potential possibilities of what I have shown here, but you can find all that online. But I really want to emphasize a few. Uh, Lycopen, that's something that is found in tomatoes, probably one of the most uh, popular and uh, pleasant because uh, it's easy to eat. Everybody likes tomatoes, pizza, tomato sauce, because it, uh, tomato sauce, uh, when we cook uh, tomatoes, we in increase the uh, bioavailability of uh, lycopen. It's also anti-inflammatory. Numerous uh, virtues that you have here listed, uh, uh, inhibitor of uh, cell growth, etc. Uh, isoflavon. Um, these are legumes uh, such as uh, soya beans. Uh, genistein is one of the most important molecule, uh, one of the most uh, studied uh, could uh, could contribute to reducing the risk. And a few other uh, biological uh, results. Uh, it's interesting, uh, but the, um, those against these uh, products will say it can have effects, uh, stimulating effects of the estrogenic uh, function. And some researchers a few years back said um, the estrogens on the pro effect of the estrogen on, pro on the prostate could be one of the causes of uh, prostate cancer. So, but let's not go crazy about this. I uh, eat a lot of soya, and it's uh, and I'm sure it's pretty good for my health, and it's probably good for my uh, for for any uh, prostate cancer also. Another great categories of molecules often. Uh, uh, quoted uh, green tea uh, with catechin that it has uh, within it. It has clearly antioxidant effects, uh, and we have various biological uh, effects that are positive against uh, uh, prostate uh, cancer and also against uh, ovary um, uh, cancer. Uh, and that has been studied by researchers from here. Another category here, we'll have a concrete examples. Another category of substances that could be interesting, pomegranate. Uh, for my kids, anyway, it's great. It's red, it's beautiful, and it's great. Uh, very has a very good taste. A very high quantity of polyphenols and of flavonoids. And we have found, uh, we have found uh, some anti-tumoral uh, properties uh, uh, and we can see 
we, uh, we can see more and more uh, uh, results on that. The UCLA, uh, UCLA has uh, made many, numerous studies, um, not where I studied, that's in LA, not in San Francisco, and it has really helped us understand their effect on cancer, uh, uh, prostate cancer, omega-3 also. And they noticed uh, I give you some studies with men, small studies, huh? 46 men, you see it's not very much, who had uh, prostate cancer, advanced stage, and they were using a concentrate of pomegranate. Um, uh, uh, but we're not sure that what is in the fruit will be found in the concentrate. Huh? But anyway, 83% have seen an improvement, and you can see the uh, uh, PSA increased, uh, PSA takes more time to double itself. That means it increases more slowly. It is a positive result, and it was observed. If we look at another study in another context, uh, how it's another way to uh, describe this phenomenon. We take men by category, those who have a short uh, de-doubling time, so rapid progression illness, it's more difficult to see an effect because the doubling time, short uh, time in this column, there's a few more that maybe we have uh, have uh, an extended time. Those, uh, the, the doubling time, which is a bit longer, uh, most of them will increase the time of a, a de-doubling PSA. Same here, a great majority will increase their de-doubling time. And here, uh, more people will stay in the same velocity or less will diminish. That's in the advanced phase. It shows that it can be interesting. They measured uh, at the biological level uh, various measures of the oxidative status and um, how this oxidation can be induced and the pomegranate uh, juice uh, was, was clearly indicative, was significant. So uh, quite promising. This is near the end of uh, some substances and vegetables that can be interesting. And the cruciferous vegetables, uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, they are high in sulforaphane. And these are molecules that are antioxidants, always the same principle. And that's why I present them to you in the same blog. And some studies, um, one was published in a very important uh, journal in cancer um, that demonstrated a diminution of the incidence of can prostate cancer in those who would eat more uh, cruciferous vegetables compared to those who would eat less. So that's an interesting indication there again. It's an observation. But more and more, uh, we have evidence of this. Uh, cruciferous uh, vegetables, we don't have very many studies uh, uh, that uh, challenge this, uh, this uh, virtue. Another substance, um, this is not so good for my kids. I don't know why. But um, I, I, I personally find that quite interesting. That's wine. Uh, we uh, red wine because it, uh, but in fact, probably we talk about red wine more. But uh, and it, but in fact, uh, probably any kind of wine, uh, in fact, any kind of alcohol could be as interesting. Dr. Luca, here present uh, from Laval University, your nutrition, he was mentioning. Uh, that uh, there was a trend, uh, a new trend in, 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 in nutrition where we say, well, for example, in wine, there is more than one thing. There are numerous other substances. So what is it exactly that has a good effect or the fact that, that you may take a, a drink of alcohol a day, it, it is associated to various personal characteristics that can also be positive. So it is very difficult to know exactly what is having um, 
an example of uh, what can be it's another example of that shows why it's so difficult to study there are numerous variables there are other elements other phenomena that takes place and it's difficult to measure and it can affect uh, uh, the evolution of the cancer and the way that uh, we uh, consume uh, these molecules uh, another example that we should be careful with uh, red wine it was uh, uh, it was uh, we have seen that 87% uh, uh, when it was fed to mice 87% decrease in high grade uh, uh, there was an 87 decrease in high grade cancer. Maybe they were too uh, too drunk uh, to, to, to develop the cancers. But anyway, uh, and, uh, another good news, um, uh, Mr. Paget, perhaps uh, you'll see. Uh, the author of this uh, study, uh, that's uh, made with mice, but uh, he's, uh, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, uh, cancer, so I take a glass of water a day. Uh, but he was French with the guy who said that, so anyway, he was there having wine every day anyway. But uh, we don't have good data uh, for humans, but uh, we had good data with mice. And after wine, well, uh, Maybe you would be uh, willing to do other things. Uh, well, good news for you, uh, gentlemen. There's a study by uh, Gilles, one of the world experts in epidemiology for ca prostate cancer. He made a study uh, a, bit, uh, uh, a bit strange, perhaps. He had uh, uh, studied ejaculations per week uh, by around 20. Uh, the, the more frequent the ejaculations, uh, the, the, the weaker the risk for prostate. So uh, good news for you men, or perhaps for you also ladies. So uh, um, again, um, in prevention, we are always have to look at pros and cons. We have to measure pro, pros and cons. Yes, um, we can have more sexual activities, but we have to be uh, careful because it can cause some problems as well. Um, so uh, I will let the, this uh, uh, chapter aside because uh, can we prevent uh, prostate cancer with vitamins? It was a big story in general, but globally we will not prevent uh, cancer with vitamins or very precise vitamin, uh, vitamin E or selenium or vitamin D. There was uh, many studies that were very costly who were very useful because they demonstrated that one intervention at, with all could not have the same effect. That's really the theme, the theme of my research. We have to understand what is the biology of all that, what are the risk factors to identify for each individual the factor or the factors that we can improve. Because one doses of vitamin E, same for all, it can be toxic for one, and it, would, it could increase the risk of cardiovascular uh, diseases, and it could be not sufficient for, for, for another one, who has never consumed any in, it, in his diet for too long. So one intervention is not always the same effect with everyone. OK, that's a bit mistake. I talked about uh, lycopene already in tomato. And the last trend, uh, biologically, uh, we, it's, we don't assess that too much. But biologically speaking, we combine nutraceutics, uh, soya and tomatoes, uh, uh, turmeric and soya, uh, turmeric and green tea. It's interesting but because we can uh, evaluate the synergies, but with humans, we don't really know. And, uh, and we don't really know how to prescribe any cocktails. Contrary to any uh, uh, natural product uh, salespersons, we have to remember that. Uh, if you take certain substances like homeopathy, there's not much risk. But if you take natural products, you can ruin your liver, your kidneys. You have to be careful. You have to talk with people who know what they're talking about. And that's probably your, your uh, family uh, physician. Last category of substances that I want to talk about, because I'm more interested in that, it's uh, uh, lipids, um, the good fats, uh, bad fats. So good fats and bad fats. Uh, lipids, uh, omega-6, and all industrial fats, like trans fats and, or of uh, uh, animal food. It's good to have red meat, but you should consume it with moderation, because it's also the way it is cooked that could contribute 
to uh, the uh, apparition of uh, uh, cancers. Uh, fish with omega-3, and we believe omega-3 is very good against uh, prostate cancer, perhaps, but there are studies now that demonstrate that in the diabetes, not in cancer, that fish itself could be more beneficial against uh, diabetes than the same do doses of omega-3 uh, for cancer. So so maybe this ph phenomenon, it's the same for pr prostate cancer. That means you're probably better to eat good sources of nutrition, complete sources, than all these uh, uh, little uh, supplements here and there. Because it's difficult to measure, to quantify what the, in terms of what these uh, uh, substances contain. Uh, here, uh, in a, a model, uh, murine, where we gave a supplement uh, for animals. Uh, they maintained their weight, but the volume of their uh, tumors increased uh, faster. Mice, for example, uh, when it, there was a lot of om omega-3, om omega-6 uh, compared to omega-3, uh, the PSA that we talked about was lower when they had omega-3 uh, supplements and there were biological uh, markers that diminished in uh, the tumors. So that's interesting. With humans, now we had uh, meta-analysis, so we gave, put in a lot of data, but uh, it's not always easy to extract the information, the uh, precise information and all the details that are important uh, to us in these meta-analyses, but still it gives us a good idea. And what we can see is that the, the more to the left on this scale, one here is uh, nil, no effect, uh, to the right is increase of the risk, and to the left is a pr higher protection against the risk. So you can see that so it's in the middle or more to the left, and when we look at all that together, there is a protective effect against uh, prostate cancer, but this effect is more important. It's a recent meta-analysis here. It was published only four years ago, and I had seen that when I was in San Francisco. This effect is, in fact, stronger when we we deal with a more aggressive or metastatic uh, prostate cancer. And that was an interesting signal because it is very difficult to define what can prevent uh, uh, prostate cancer because a lot is detected by screening. Uh, it's a challenge for us urologists to, to, to who uh, should be treated and how. But if we want to prevent cancer, which is um, really what we want to do. It has, we have to be sure that it has an effect on uh, aggressive uh, phases, and it's true for omega-3. So that's uh, um, another uh, study that we carried out, but uh, we we'll don't really have time to look into this. Uh, when I was in San Francisco, we also had another study, and we showed that American men who consumed more fish uh, had a risk of aggressive uh, cancer that was lower than those who would eat less. Diminution of the risk, that was quite uh, significant. A third, uh, those who, had, uh, who, who were eating more omega-3, uh, number four, uh, com compared to the others. Trend was quite strong, but it was not uh, uh, true for all. Uh, now, the hypothesis uh, under this uh, theme it is that um, despite all the uh, prost prostate cancer incidence continues to to, to increase. Uh, although we don't do more screening today than 10 years ago, certainly not, but it is still increasing. So my hypothesis it is maybe linked to an uh, evolutionary trend that is uh, recently um, Maybe it is this association between prostate cancer uh, that is increasing. It was perhaps linked to our uh, nutrition habits. Uh, and uh, I link that also to inflammation because it, it is uh, the uh, most uh, trendy hypothesis in uh, anti inflammation strategy uh, hypothesis. So maybe it would be interesting to work on uh, inflammation to treat uh, uh, prostate cancer eventually. The prost, uh, prostate inflammation can be of various causes, including nutrition. And uh, translational uh, research would like to determine and understand this uh, biology, but in humans. So it could be a bit uh, closer to us um, uh, to see if it has a significance for men. 
We have uh, developed uh, human uh, derivatives uh, uh, with, uh, and uh, we have more than 120 cells that we can identify, uh, support cells and others, and we can characterize that quite well. And with model, we realize that inflammation really uh, seems to have an effect. Uh, patients with uh, high-grade cancer here to the right had a level of inflammation that was quite high than uh, patients with no cancer or with uh, uh, small level cancers. It is interesting, but it is not uh, from uh, my studies. It's really uh, measured with humans. And uh, today, we uh, use a model of sequencing in collaboration with a researcher in um, epigenomic uh, uh, at our uh, research ten, uh, center, we try to understand what regulates uh, these genes and uh, could be caused by inflammation and ca how uh, this can be linked to uh, uh, prostate cancer. We also tested uh, uh, various uh, models, uh, uh, substances, nutrients, and uh, we realized that uh, in terms of inhibition uh, of the inflammation, the higher in the scale here, the better the effect. And the capsaicin had an interesting effect, gingerol a bit less, uh, resveratrol was not so-so because sometimes we had an effect that increased the inflammation, but fish oil had a strong protective effect against the, the uh, generation of inflammation with this artificial uh, model that we created. That's interesting. It's not the uh, perspective. So now we have a randomized uh, test uh, with patients for some years now. And um, uh, it gives uh, randomly uh, di uh, dietary fat intervention or uh, dutasterate. And what are the signals, uh, positive uh, signals that are interesting to us? And uh, we examined, in fact, uh, the data. A part of the data at the beginning of the study, and uh, we saw that our hypothesis uh, makes sense because the EPA rate was a, uh, inversely linked to the progression of the cancer, of a small cancer, to a, a higher uh, stage from six to seven, inverted uh, relation, a bit of instability in the model because uh, it was a small sampling. But this relation seems to make sense, and we were quite happy to publish that in a prestigious journal. Uh, we have another randomized test now funded, and it will start uh, very soon for a man with aggressive prostate cancer and which uh, uh, have uh, selected uh, have decided to to uh, make a ablation and, uh, and we will uh, randomly give a supplement in omega-3 and placebo to see the effects it may have on on uh, the prostate itself, on uh, prostate cancer after uh, removal, and also quality of life. Because as Mr. Paget has said, it is very important. And uh, it is very important to us. So maybe it could be a strategy that could improve uh, the quality of life. Now, uh, I have uh, I'm, I'm almost finished with my time, but anyway, I had uh, been asked to t give also an overview of the role of uh, exercise in the uh, prostate cancer. So if we are not too sure regarding nutrition uh, in terms of its effect on the human uh, health and in uh, prostate cancer in particular, well, it is even more uncertain uh, with respect to the effect of exercise on cancer. However, some things do uh, appear quite clearly. We don't need to be an epidemi epidemiologist to know that. Why exercise will be good for you? Well, it has uh, no negative effect. Uh, only if you exaggerate and you haven't done uh, exercise too much. It happened to me a little while ago. I thought I could play soccer like when I was 25, and it wasn't the case. But uh, generally, it has only positive effects. And the more you do in moderate uh, state, intensity, uh, moderate intensity, the, the better it will be for you. Regarding cancer, well, it has uh, mainly effect on the quality of life. That's what we're uh, observing more and more. 
for example, exercising uh, in a moderate uh, manner before uh, uh, operation, it could uh, help uh, uh, eliminating in part the problems of incontinence uh, after uh, operation, after surgery. A uh, quick uh, walk, uh, 90 minutes per week, it's not all that much, but it's not for all, could perhaps reduce the risk of mortality, global risk, not necessarily only in prostate cancer, but uh, globally, and uh, moderate exercise. Um, a bit more here, three hours per week. There's a multiplication of these studies that show clearly a protective effect on the health in general. It increases the endurance of the heart and increases longevity. And there are various mechanisms, biological mechanisms that are slowly being demonstrated that could explain the benefits of exercise, inflammation, another important uh, element because inflammation in fact is a question that it is something that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is at stake in numerous other uh, situations. So inflammation is part of uh, the whole process. And with uh, respect to men with prostate uh, cancer, it's a bit more controversial because we have less uh, studies, but there are many studies still showing that you are going to improve the quality of life with exercise for those undergoing treatment. For example, if you take hormonal therapy for uh, prostate cancer, for example, and if you um, follow an exercise program supervised by physiotherapists, it's always a bit complex. Uh, well, it is shown that there will be an improvement of your quality of life uh, with certain parameters that we have here. But it's still controversial because other studies, other trials, sometimes smaller because they are complex to carry out these studies, but uh, other trials observe no significant effects. No protection really observed sometimes with respect to quality of life. But still, it is one of the important mechanisms whereby we could modify our uh, behavior and our life habits, nutrition, sexual habits, but also exercise. And uh, we have had the, the pleasure of uh, seeing one of our projects funded, and I'm one of the epidemiologists here who worked a lot with that uh, uh, project with other colleagues from our centers, Dr. Bayrati and Meyer, and also for, uh, Dr. Franco from McGill. And this study uses the Procure uh, network to uh, put into place this protocol and uh, is uh, involving, uh, is, is made for men with a first uh, diagnosis and we often receive uh, emails uh, be careful, uh, gentlemen, it is only for men who has had a first uh, negative biopsy on which they show there was no cancer. Unfortunately, there's a risk of uh, 15 to 20 percent that there will have been, uh, that there might have been a cancer that has not been shown uh, in the tests. Uh, so we have biomarkers uh, here. We want to see what biomarkers will be uh, associated prospectively with uh, the uh, uh, resurgence of a cancer. So we want to have 3,000 men in this study. It is a study in which it is very easy to participate because we it needs only a few hours uh, at a given point in time. Uh, patients who uh, uh, or propose this uh, study are very happy to participate and they know that maybe they will participate to, uh, to, to something for the generations to come because it is a very difficult clinical situation. So I invite you to participate in it. It is uh, thanks. It is done uh, to. It is thanks to the network set up by uh, Procure. So in conclusion, it's quite general, uh, perhaps, but uh, that's about what we can say right now. You should eat well and and do a moderate physical activity on a regular basis. It can certainly improve your quality of life and could probably diminish the uh, risk of uh, prostate cancer, whether before diagnosis or during the treatment. So thank you very much for your t attention. And I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators at the, the uh, SHU Hospital and team with Dr. Lacombe and our other colleagues and uh, urologists. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fadet. We have a question period now. I don't know what time it is. It's 9.15, perhaps 15 minutes. Yes, sir. We uh, will give you a, a mic. Please use the mic. Uh, if not, uh, uh, if not, uh, people on the web and translators will not be able to uh, to listen. 
Microphone is coming. We, uh, we won't uh, put the camera on you. We want uh, your interventions to remain uh, uh, confidential. Dr. Fradet, I found uh, very interesting the questions, uh, the, all these uh, uh, information about uh, nutrition. Uh, when uh, you said, uh, I heard uh, that uh, cancer would not develop if we would have pH neutral. H have you ever uh, studied the pH uh, uh, with respect to uh, disease uh, development? It is a very good uh, element. It's not a factor that I know very much about. Maybe Dr. Lacombe could have something to say about it. What is clear is that uh, prostate uh, cancer is a very frequent uh, condition, as you have seen. And there is a uh, tremendous quantity of uh, studies that were made with respect to risk uh, 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 possibilities. Uh, and every day we have new articles uh, indicating uh, showing in new biomarkers. So yes, maybe, uh, maybe, but it is clearly not something um, uh, something that we have studied in the clinic. Uh, however, uh, so I don't, uh, I don't recommend that you take alkalines in order to reduce uh, your pH, in order to have uh, an acid the pH. But, uh, but it is uh, something that perhaps should be more looked into. Any other question? I have a question for each of uh, the uh, speakers. Dr. Fradet uh, first. Have you ever studied the link between the type of uh, jobs that we have, for example, in offices where we're sitting down more, uh, for, for example, compared to jobs where you stand up? Is there a link uh, with respect to these uh, cancers? And they are nutritional. Are there nutritional or physical activities uh, can, that can have contrary effects that uh, with respect to uh, prostate cancer and for Dr. Lacombe, in all the treatments that you have identified, I wanted to have your opinion on uh, the uh, possibility of using viruses to fight cancer. So with respect to your question on uh, exercise and uh, after that we'll talk about the nutrition. Exercise, in fact, um, we uh, measure it in mainly in our sports activities. That's mainly what has been measured, and there's quite a big uh, literature, quite, quite a bit controversial, as I have said, but that supports a protective effect on uh, with, uh, with respect to exercise. But, uh, but uh, uh, there's also uh, exercise in, uh, linked to your uh, job, and that is only starting to be looked into. And the uh, Armand Frappier Institute is uh, amongst the uh, centers which uh, are looking into this uh, in Quebec and in the world. And it developed a very complex uh, structure with characteristics uh, regarding what is a good professional uh, job to measure what you're talking about, the uh, uh, energy uh, production or expense of a given profession or job. If I work as a, on a, a construction site, I don't uh, spend as much energy or the same kind of energy as if I sit at, at a desk. And there are other phenomena as well uh, linked to your environment. And there are other risk factors that could maybe uh, produce inflammation. But it's a very, very new field. And maybe we could uh, link other environmental uh, factors not necessarily linked to to um, quality of life. But it's really starting. In the, com in the years to come, it's go going to be uh, it'll be developed more, I'm sure. Regarding nutrition, that could increase uh, the risk. Well, I have indicated it a little bit, but very rapidly. It is uh, maybe we could uh, I, uh, uh, trans fats and other bad fats. Uh, it certainly would be uh, negative. Uh, some studies uh, have been carried out by uh, epidemiologists in collaboration with urologists that the, showing that the uh, general the the total production of uh, consumption of fat could be linked to uh, higher rates of death uh, for uh, uh, prostate cancer especially especially with uh, saturated fats uh, 
industrial fat or animal uh, fat. The way you cook uh, the food also could uh, trigger, uh, there are many, many other examples, but uh, PHIP, it's a molecule that uh, is genera generated in decarbonization, for example, barbecue, and we have uh, black meat, and that's probably carcinogenic. Uh, so that's probably increasing your risk factor. Is it a cause, absolute cause for prostate cancer? Probably not, but it's strong enough for it to be considered a, a, a cause among others. Viruses. Now here at the Hotel Dieu, we don't have any study using viruses, but it's possible that in other centers in North America that they do use viruses. I'm not aware of that, though. But to use vaccines, it is something that is starting to be looked into, and we have uh, used it with our studies in the U.S. Uh, that were made, uh, uh, anti-tumor vaccine. So we were using proteins to create a vaccine that would fight the, the, the cancer. It's been studied here. We made studies, um, uh, a vaccine for prostate uh, cancer, but it was negative. So it's been researched. Maybe there are studies, uh, antivirus, uh, but not in our center, and not that I know uh, elsewhere in Canada or the US. Another question? Web question. I was operated in May for prostatectomy. I take five uh, milligram of a, uh, of a drug, uh, with a, uh, but I see no result uh, for with respect to erectile dysfunction. I see no results. Should I continue, in your opinion, to use these drugs? The uh, erectile dysfunction after uh, such a treatment be it uh, after uh, prostatectomy is a very uh, frequent condition and sometimes it can take a little while, uh, weeks, months, uh, and in some cases some uh, patients uh, say that their uh, sexual function improve years after that. So no, you shouldn't lose uh, any fate, uh, but there are some evidences of uh, average quality. Uh, let's say that maybe uh, this drug could uh, improve the quality of uh, uh, your erections, but it's quite costly. It is no clear answer. Yes, good evening for Dr. Lacombe. Why is it, can we, why can we not remove the prostate if we have metastasis? Why don't we, can we not do that? You know, usually in medicine, we have to have had evidences that if we do something, we would change the evolution of the disease. For men with metastatic cancers, no study have shown that the fact of removing only the prostate would be sufficient to improve your quality of life and your survival expectation, because possibly at the time of the diagnosis, there were other um, diseases. So uh, if we have no evidence in good studies that it will change the prognosis of the patient in general, this option is not looked into. So since there is no evidence with what you have just mentioned um, that were described in the studies, that's why it's not a treatment that is uh, looked into, w whether it is a prostatectomy or a radiation. Uh, the other aspect also is that uh, it is more and more clear today that uh, we have a multiplicity of treatments and uh, these uh, treatments globally, uh, systemically speaking, are very efficient and they function well. And we talked about it today. We talked about various drugs today. Um, partners of Procure, we thank them again, and they work well, these uh, drugs. So yes, sir. After that, the gentleman here, Mr. Paget, the, your life before your cancer and your life today. Uh, the stress that kills, that's what I'm referring to. Could you talk about it a little bit? Well, with time, it diminishes, of course. And I am happy to be alive today. 
and to be uh, to have fun with my kids and to see my grandkids and to continue to work and we have to keep uh, hope as I was saying to I don't know who I was speaking with earlier there is hope uh, we can't cure cancer we can't control it though and prostate cancer has uh, progressed we have had a lot of uh, evolution in this field uh, as we have seen and I think today we have numerous drugs that can improve uh, our uh, condition and uh, extend life uh, in January it will be 19 years since I was diagnosed and I continue I have faith and with time I don't know if you have been operated or if you will be operated but with time the stress diminishes and you know well after a while we say I have a normal life I've had a normal sexual life for many years and I often say the uh, Jacques Duval uh, says often it was uh, before <laughs> it was <laughs> before the prostatic orgasm exists we don't talk about it uh, very much and it was extraordinary but uh, but still there is a big stress I still think uh, I don't think about it as often as in the past but it is part of my life I have learned to to live with it I hope it answers your question thank you what do you think about the various opinions regarding the evolution of PSA? There is uh, another uh, result of the task force that says uh, it's not important, but my, when my PSA changes, well, it bothers me. Well, you know, in the various organizations, what you are referring to is uh, with respect to screening, what the task force recommends is that we shouldn't do any screening anymore. What I tried to present uh, earlier is that uh, we see that there are many studies that don't have the same data. The American study was negative in terms of screening. The European study was rather positive. So I think that the position of the College of Physicians in Quebec was balanced. It said it is something uh, we should uh, consider, but we have to select the uh, populations. And there are advantages with the uh, screening and sometimes disadvantages. There can be some complications. And it is in speaking with the patients that uh, we may uh, end up with the appropriate answer for everyone. So in medicine, it's not often black or white. There's a lot of gray, and there's a lot of gray in uh, prostate cancer. After the radical uh, prostatectomy, um, there again, there seems to be different points of view. After a prostatectomy, a, a PSA is an excellent marker because since there are no prostate, if PSA is present, there is certainly a possibility that there be uh, cells uh, uh, to be to be uh, verified in, in, in the organism of uh, the, the patient. And then we can look at various options for you according to uh, to uh, these results. Yeah. I talked to a gentleman, uh, he's 50, uh, he was diagnosed with a non-aggressive cancer. He was very nervous, very stressed, of course. Uh, uh, you know, it's understandable, but I managed to convince him that he was lucky, that he had been screened, and he, every four months he should follow his uh, monitoring, and he'll see the progression, and he'll be able to have a normal life. He'll know that he has a cancer, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, and every m four months, he'll uh, have a test, and the doctor will say, OK, it increases a little bit, and he'll see what to do uh, year after year. And if I may uh, add a comment, uh, as what you're saying, Mr. Paget, it was very clearly illustrated in one of the conferences in San Francisco uh, with respect to localized uh, cancer. We had a, uh, a religious man who had said that for him, the prostate diagnosis, the prostate cancer diagnosis in no way had shown him the sense of what life could be for him. Because for him to uh, to, to live with cancer, he was enjoying more the uh, moment and, and everything around him, the family, etc., what was important for him in life. Because, uh, because uh, what is absurd is that we all know we're going to die. 
but uh, and, uh, and second thing is that we pay taxes. But this absurdity, uh, if we are aware of this reality, uh, uh, which is death at the end of the life of our life, well, we will be more conscious of the quality of the moment and will be perhaps more alive uh, every day. And that's the message of hope is really that we have to be able to 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 take advantage of, of the moment. Often every morning when I get up, I think maybe it's uh, the last day of my life. What am I going to do fun today? So this is the attitude that I think we should have. And as Dr. Fredat has said, of course, we'll all uh, die. We'll all die. It, uh, it's clear that uh, death is part of life. Yes, sir. We, t we were talking about PSA earlier. I was just operated. I, I, I say to uh, I say to people around me, do your PSA, do your rectal touch. Uh, screening is important. Uh, we shouldn't wait to have the symptoms. Uh, you should be screened regularly at any age. That's why. I'm not a scientist, but you say that a PSA is not good. But that's how I was detected, plus genetics, etc. But I don't know what to say to the others, because I speak about it with the others. I talked about it to my friends, to my brother, to everyone around me. Well, you know, my goal uh, this evening was to show the general uh, view. Uh, I encourage screening, and when men come to me, uh, I, uh, if they don't want to have a PSA, okay, but I'm going to suggest it. So what I wanted to say here this evening, there are questions. Everything is not clear. Uh, I personally think screening is good, but, uh, but uh, there are various recommendations. The task force is not in favor, but I, I certainly favor it. Something is quite clear, and we uh, see that a bit too much in Quebec. Uh, we don't see that so much in the U.S., but that's why it has such an impact and in the U.S., because screening is done there uh, in a more d discriminate matter, less adapted to each uh, patient, because the majority of people here in the room are interested by uh, prostate cancer, personally, or or because it's in the family, and this fear will, will be uh, will translate into well, I want to do everything to avoid having this cancer. But there's a category of people that will shut their eyes and will say, well, I don't want to. I don't want to know if uh, uh, I don't want to know if I do have uh, possibility of cancer that will shorten my life. I prefer not to know about it and just to continue my life as. A, uh, and live as, as usual, and it's another way to pro take advantage of their life. So that's why the, the best recommendation is talk about it with your physician. He will ask questions, and they will define if it's pertinent for you or not. And if uh, for you, uh, you really want to know, well, the answer is clear. You should have a screening of your PSA, unfortunately. Uh, contrary to what is happening in the U.S., where there is uh, maybe too much PSA with not enough uh, precision, uh, that's why the study was negative and it was negative in the U.S. and positive positive in in, the, in in Europe. In Quebec, in fact, we don't do it enough because uh, about 10 percent of our patients with uh, new diagnosed. Uh, prostate cancer, they come much too late. The cancer is too advanced with metastasis, and these people often evolve very rapidly. So of course, if we had identified that earlier, probably a better quality of life and more survival rate. But we have to be able to look at both sides. The other side is that these studies have examined only the criterion of mortality. And of course, it's very important. We die uh, of that cancer of, for, so, of, or from something else, but didn't take into, evolu uh, into consideration the evolution of the disease and the quality of life and, uh, and how it is alterated after the diagnosis.
Question for Dr. Lacombe. I would like to know if um, uh, after the operation, the PSA test, like uh, any other cancer, after five years we have less risk, or how is it? Well, the studies say in general uh, that uh, the, the period with more risk of uh, reoccurrence, it is during the five years after. But the study was carried out many years ago. I forget the author. We had looked at men with treatment for prostate cancer, and they had had reoccurrence. And after prostatectomy had increased, uh, and it's not the case of most patients uh, after an operation. And we had looked uh, when uh, the PSA had uh, increased. 45% uh, of patients had seen their PSA increase after two years. And the two years after surgery, 30% had seen PSA increase uh, between the year, the year two and five. So 75% who had uh, presented uh, biochemical failure was during the first five years. And 25% left, it was between year five and 10. So if you're one of my patients, you will be followed until the rest of your life. I will I will make PSAs, I will increase the interval in time, but I will follow you to be sure that there is no biochemical failure because if there is one I can see I can I can offer uh, options of treatments according to your PSA. So personally after 5 years no I don't stop the follow up. Uh, it's been 18 years this year now that I have come back from New York. I saw my the first patient that I operated 18 years ago. I still follow him. He comes to me and I control his PSAs, but the intervals, of course, is, uh, is larger. It's uh, one or twice a year now. Two, two last questions from the web. After a prosectomy, uh, the PSA rate smaller than 0 0.01 is considered nil, or is it considered as a latent problem? The, yeah, it's zero. Last, last question, yes, sir. Short testimony. With respect to screening, more than 20 years ago, my father had prostate cancer. It was in screen uh, with the methods of the time, and when they found it, it was metastatic, and I saw the evolution. Uh, of his cancer, and I saw him die. When I was screened, I thought, uh, I, uh, I said, it's maybe not normal, but I said, I'm happy, to be, I'm happy that I had been screened, and I was happy to know that I had been screened in time, uh, and that it was only localized, and we could have an intervention, and we could solve it. So um, maybe I'm not normal, but uh, how many years now? It's not. It's been only one year, but still, it all goes well. You look well, anyway. Thank you. Last question. You didn't. You haven't uh, spoke about. Uh, uh, you know. In these presentations, uh, we we have to make a selection of what we'll be talking about. There are so many aspects, and the curie therapy it's one of the options uh, when the cancer is localized. It is an option that has advantages but also disadvantages, and that it it can be compared to a surgery. So it's different, of course, but uh, but it's a curative approach. It's a treatment when I uh, meet my patients uh, according uh, on uh, what they want. I'll be talking about it. It's part of the tools, uh, curative tools that we may uh, use for uh, localized uh, cancers. But uh, this evening, I just wanted to answer some questions and make an overview. And I couldn't include that because it's, it's quite specialized. And I, and I, I talked uh, 45 minutes, and there are many things I didn't have time to, uh, to uh, think about and talk about. Last question, sir. After a biopsy, of a prostate if uh, I've, I get told that I have a cancer. Is it the same treatment for each person or will it be discussed with my physician? No. It is important. According to uh, 
the parameters, your PSA, your analysis, the, the type of your disease, you will be offered various theoretical uh, options. Maybe four options will be proposed to you, uh, curative options or follow-up. So there are various uh, alternatives there that will be proposed to you according to the diagnosis. So it's not one discussion for all. You'll have a personal discussion with your physician according to your disease. So thank you very much, Dr. Fradet, Dr. Lacombe. Thank you to you all. If uh, uh, if you if there are more questions, maybe you didn't want to ask a question. Maybe it was too personal. We have a phone number that appears on the screen. It is uh, toll free, and somebody will be phoning back. It's. Uh, confidential. You don't have to give all your name. You can see if Peter's phoning. Could you please phone me back? I would have a question. We have nurses uh, that are very qualified, can answer your question. And if it's beyond their competence, a doctor will phone back. We have numerous uh, urologists on our board of directors. So thank you very much. We are small, but we have a big heart. Laurent and I, we have our bow tie. It's the first time we just launched this new program. We want this to become a symbol of uh, fight against uh, prostate cancer in Quebec. Your money will stay here. Administration fees are 13 percent at Procure. So every donation, um, every time you give $1.87 will be for the biobank or research or field work. Thank you very much again. If I summarize, Dr. Lacombe, there is hope. There is a lot of hope. There are many new drugs, a lot of research, and it is very encouraging. And Dr. Fredette, if I summarize, I should start eating pomegranate, uh, broccoli, red wine, and exercise. Thank you very much.